this is a video in a series that I'm producing on our son's condition called Juvenile Idiopathic Arthritis, or JIA. So Juvenile Idiopathic Arthritis is an autoimmune condition. Our son Grayson has a condition called oligoarticular JIA, which means a small number of his limbs are involved. In his case, both knees experienced inflammation as a result of his condition, and then we found that his eyes also had a condition called uveitis, and these were treated um, in, in very different ways from each other. So the purpose of the video today is to go through the treatment protocols of what he, what he experienced um, in his treatment plan, and then also to kind of generalize it to autoimmune conditions in general. Um, as far as I can tell, this is oftentimes exactly how it is approached for many different autoimmune um, conditions. There are chapter markers in the menu bar below here, and so feel free to jump forward in the lecture. I'm gonna have a number of introductory comments and caveats at the start here, which sometimes um, people don't really like to sit through all that stuff, so you can sit through it if you like, or you can just skip forward if you want more information about inflammation or more information about uh, the, the, the treatment protocols themselves. Feel free to skip forward. My first ca caveat is that I have never taught a class in pharmacology. I teach anatomy and physiology, and uh, therefore I'm familiar with the physiology of the body, and it's, it's comfortable for me to have a discussion about how the body works and kind of the things that can go wrong with it. However, I've never taught a class in pharmacology. I've never taken a class in pharmacology, <laughs> so I'm sure to get some of the details and some of the biochemistry incorrect here. I don't have a textbook for pharmacology. I'm not sure that a textbook would have actually served me well though. This particular field um, is, a, is advancing very quickly, year by year by year. There are so many changes that honestly, a seminar from 10 years ago is no longer relevant. So the way that I prepared for this was, of course I read some peer reviewed papers. I found that the most reliable way to prepare for the lecture today was to watch YouTube videos that are seminars that were um, that were presented at medical conferences. And so I didn't know this, they actually make some of those seminars available freely on YouTube. When I was in grad school, I found that seminars were the best way to learn new information about a hot, you know, fast moving field. Uh, because you'd have a person at the front of the room, they'd have their prepared PowerPoint that honestly, in the PowerPoint, there would be a lot of redundant information, information you kind of already knew. But the little in-between comments <laughs> was oftentimes really helpful. You know, things that might not, you know, that hadn't yet passed through the peer-reviewed process. So it was brand new information, something they had just learned from the lab yesterday, or a little experience they'd had with a patient, for example. Um, oftentimes these little nuggets would sort of make your mind you know, you, you really make you think about the topic um, in a totally new way. And I found that to be true in these as well. Um, just little, little things that were said in between, like little side comments, little side stories, little examples were very helpful in um, understanding this topic much better. As far as I can derive, a standard treatment protocol for most autoimmune conditions is sort of here, listed here, one, two, three, and four. Number one, NSAIDs. If the NSAIDs don't work out very well, you move on to steroids. If the steroids don't do it, you move on to antimetabolites, and then from there you move on to biologics. And so I will be showing you the uh, what what an inflammatory pathway actually looks like, and then you can see I I put one, two, three, and four down there to kind of show you the pathway and where these different types of treatments might come into play in mitigating an inflammatory response. When a person has an autoimmune condition, oftentimes they will have what they call flares or episodes where their symptoms will spike. It'll get more painful. It'll get more inflamed. Um, the condition will get to be more painful. It will be harder to walk. You'll go through a period where you can't see as well, for example. At these times, what is happening is that the tissue is inflamed. And so the way to treat an autoimmune condition is to mitigate the inflammation. This may be the time to put another caveat out there to say that as far as I know, there is no cure for any autoimmune condition. All we can do is try to mitigate the inflammatory response 
All we can do is try to, to minimize the effect of an episode or a flare, to try to tamp down those symptoms so that they're not um, affecting the individual asthma. I did come across one rare autoimmune condition that uh, it, it was, it was, it's lesions in the skin that are caused by B lymphocytes. Now B lymphocytes are these programmable little cells in your body. And because this, these lesions are caused only by the B lymphocytes, what they're working on in this case is actually reprogramming the B lymphocytes, these faulty little guys, and they're reprogramming them to make sure that the B lymphocytes are no longer causing these lesions. If they, at this point, I think it's only in animal models, but if they're actually able to translate this into humans, that actually would be considered a cure. However, most autoimmune conditions are not caused by B lymphocytes. Oftentimes the, the culprits would be, for example, macrophages or undifferentiated T lymphocytes. And therefore, uh, <laughs> those are not the types of cells that can be reprogrammed. In fact, you really need them working. That's, that's the other hard part about this. You really need the immune system working very well to stave off you know, infections and viruses and pathogens that attack your body, bacteria, fungi. So you need your immune system to be working properly and you can't simply reprogram everything. You can't get rid of the macrophages. You would end up you know, having to live like David in a bubble, if you've ever heard of that, that condition, uh, skid, where you simply couldn't have any interaction with the environment at all. So you need your immune system, I guess is what I'm saying. But what you're trying to do is get the immune system simply not to work uh, against your body. A couple more things about inflammation. In my opinion, and I don't know if this is a universally held opinion, but it, as far as I can tell, inflammation is involved in, all, in, in many, many different disorders and dysfunctions that occur in your body. Uh, and the reason for it is that inflammation is one of the only tools your body actually has to fight things off, especially in the short run. If you have something that's moving against your body quickly, inflammation is the, what your body throws at it. And there's, there's, lots, you know, there's lots of different aspects to the inflammatory response, but um, inflammation in general is fairly limited in what it can do. Something goes wrong with a tissue in your body, it becomes inflamed. You know, you're attacked by a pathogen, you have an inflammatory response. Inflammation is a universally shared across most animals uh, ability of the body to fight off things in the short term and it, it oftentimes is very effective. Now there are three different types of inflammation. There is, a, there is acute inflammation, which would be a reasonable response that the body has to some kind of an, uh, an insult on the body. Think about if you've ever sprained your ankle, oftentimes your ankle will swell up. That is an inflammatory response. And it's appropriate to have acute, acute inflammatory events in response to injury. Where we start to have issues is when you have chronic or episodic types of inflammation. So episodic, as the name suggests, is where you have episodes where the inflammation comes and goes, not appropriate, you're not actually responding to some kind of an external assault. You are simply, your body is, um, is, is experiencing an episode of inflammation for no particular reason. The body senses that something is going wrong when in fact it is not. And then there is chronic inflammation where the symptoms become, um, the symptoms go up and then they simply stay high. You can actually have chronic inflammation and have episodes <laughs> on top of that. So acute, chronic, and episodic. Even acute forms of, of uh, inflammation can give you trouble. For example, some individuals when they were infected with the coronavirus, especially when the coronavirus made its way into the cells of the lungs and began infecting the cells of the lungs, uh, the body responded, no surprise, with an inflammatory response. And in some cases, the inflammatory response kind of got out of control and you ended up with what's called a cytokine storm. We'll talk about what cytokines are during this presentation today. <laughs> so a cytokine storm uh, could oftentimes end up uh, causing an inflammatory event, although it's acute, 
kind of a one-time deal, uh, sometimes even just that one acute response can give you lots of trouble. People would end up with fluid in their lungs, for example, and end up in the hospital as a result. It's time to actually discuss the inflammatory response here. Now, what we have here is what's called, a, what would be considered a normal tissue. You could think of any tissue of the body. Um, in this case, uh, it might be helpful to think of the membranes of the knees or the membranes of the eyes. Here in black, I have some cells that belong to this particular tissue. And what, this is a tissue that we would consider to be a vascular tissue, which means that it receives a blood supply, which I have shown here. What we have back here is a tube called an arteriole. This would be the very smallest blood vessel that would be bringing blood directly to that tissue. And then it branches into a capillary bed. It's normally a capillary bed would have between 10 and 100 capillaries. I've shown three sort of to give you an idea of how it works. So the arteriole brings blood into the region and then the capillaries branch from there. And what you'll notice is that the tissue in black here, these cells here in black, uh, they're very close to the capillaries. The capillaries are well known for things like exchanging oxygen into the tissues, picking up carbon dioxide from the tissues, bringing nutrients into the tissues, or picking up metabolic waste products from the tissues. That's sort of what capillaries are known to do. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit more about a secondary thing that capillaries do here. So in green, I have these green circles, these tiny little green circles. I don't know if you can see them inside of this arteriole. Uh, and those are white blood cells. The white blood cells circulate in the blood on a regular basis. And basically, they are they're meant to stay inside of the tubes. They're meant to stay inside of the arterioles and inside of the capillaries. However, you will notice if you look closely that one of these little white blood cells has actually escaped. <laughs> it's actually squeezed out of the capillary here at this little crack, a tiny, tiny little crack that's called an intercellular cleft. In, depending on what type of capillary you're dealing with, the crack might be quite small or quite large. So these intercellular clefts allow the white blood cells to leave out of the tube, leave out of the capillary through a process called diapodesis. And then the white blood cells will simply make their way through these black cells, through this tissue, uh, and uh, monitor for a number of different issues you might have, perhaps cancerous cells, perhaps an infection, um, perhaps a virus or a bacterium starting to come along and give you some trouble. Additionally, there's a little bit of fluid that leaves out of these, uh, these intercellular clefts. And that fluid is called interstitial fluid, or IF. And there's always a little bit of interstitial fluid that is left behind, even in normal tissue. You're going to have some white blood cells leave the blood vessel and you're going to have some interstitial fluid or IF also leave, leave the blood vessel, usually through these intracellular clefts. Now if we take a look over at the inflamed tissue, one of the things you might notice right away is the fact that the arteriole is dilated or it is enlarged, it has been widened. And so in this case, we are bringing in more blood into the region. The intercellular clefts themselves are quite large. So there are two things that happen in an inflammatory response pretty much every time. The dilation of the arterioles and the widening of these intercellular clefts with two results that are characteristic aspects of what an inflammatory response actually is. An inflammatory response is characterized pretty much every time by redness and swelling. An inflammatory response is pretty much always characterized by redness and edema, which is a fluid buildup. And that is actually caused by these two first things that I've drawn and pointed out for you. The redness of inflammation is actually caused by the dilated arterioles. If you think about it, uh, there isn't gonna be just one dilated arteriole. 
In the region of an inflammation, you will have dozens of arterioles that are dilated or hundreds or thousands, depending on where you are in the body and depending on how much of your body is actually affected by the inflammation. And therefore, the dilated arterioles all together start to cause a, a, an appearance of redness. The other thing that we see in this picture are the expanded or widened intercellular clefts, those little cracks, which were very tiny over here, <laughs> allowed for the diapodesis or the escape of a few white blood cells here and there and a little bit of fluid. Here, you're going to see a lot more of that. So we have many more white blood cells escaping from the capillaries and lots more fluids left behind as well. And so these fluids here then cause the edema. The swelling that you see during an inflammatory event is because of the widened intercellular clefts and more fluid escaping from the blood and making its way through the tissues of interest. I also want to introduce to you the idea that white blood cells will take on different characteristics during an inflammation than they do during normal conditions when the tissue is not inflamed. During inflammation, some of these white blood cells will become activated. Now, what white blood cells are, are immunity. White blood cells are also called leukocytes. And there's many different types of leukocytes. Every single white blood cell is somehow involved in the immune response, in fighting off pathogens, for example. Some of these white blood cells will produce structures called cytokines. And the cytokines go on to do all kinds of other things. The continuation of the inflammatory characteristics isn't just redness and edema, but also oftentimes heat. Now this heat will be brought about by some of these cytokines, which uh, go and interact with um, pyrogens and the, the, uh, the, the heat regulatory system, the thermoregulatory system in the brain, and allows for that heat to come into the region. So that is actually the purview of some of these cytokines that I've drawn here. Another characteristic that oftentimes occurs as a result of an inflammatory response is pain and itch. And maybe as part of that too, sometimes the tissues that you're interacting with actually become dysfunctional. Uh, a good example of that would be the idea that um, when Grayson was experiencing the worst flare-ups of his knees, it was actually really difficult for him to walk. There were some mornings he actually could not walk at all. So dysfunction of the tissues can be a part of this as well. But I did want to go back to the pain story. Treatment of pain oftentimes involves mitigation of inflammation. The pain basically falls into three different categories. The first two have to do with the nervous system. You could have a nerve that is pressed or that is crushed or that has been impinged upon somehow. That will be a painful process usually. Sometimes it would also cause numbness. And then nerve endings, the, the little sensory nerve endings, if they are in any way hyper, um, hyper uh, stimulated, that will also cause oftentimes a painful event. But the third way that you experience pain is actually through the inflammatory pathway. And that can in turn cause <laughs> pressure against nerves, it can cause overstimulation of sensory nerve endings. And so when we want to go back to the source of pain, oftentimes we're actually going back to the inflammatory process again. I want to dive a little bit deeper into those cytokines. It's important to talk about the cytokines because one of the treatment protocols that we're looking at here has to do with directly uh, treating and trying to mitigate the, uh, the, uh, the issue that is experienced by particular cytokines. I'm going to go back to this figure over here and we're going to redraw just a portion of this. We're going to draw, redraw this capillary here, these, these cells. And we'll draw it a little bit bigger. So here we have the tube called the capillary and intercellular clefts, little cracks, basically between the cells of the capillaries. 
And here we have two cells representing whatever tissue you're discussing. Now, as I said, it is possible for white blood cells to leave out of here. simply to monitor the region and make sure that there are no issues. Additionally, a small amount of fluid leaves through, through those inter intracellular clefts. If we go back to our inflammatory response here, I want to draw this capillary and these cells a little bit larger as well. You will notice right away that the intracellular clefts are much larger in your inflamed tissue, and that there starts to be a great deal of fluid leaving out of the blood. This would basically be blood plasma, usually without the proteins. And this is the kind of thing that could, for example, press on neurons or nerves in the region and start to cause pain. Um, and as you can see, if it presses against the cells in this region, it could be that dysfunction might be there as well. But what we really want to focus on is actually the white blood cells because they're going to be the culprits here. A large number of white blood cells leaving out of the blood and entering into this region and um, interacting sometimes with the cells in the area. They're simply able to leave, this, leave the blood vessel much more readily because the intracellular clefts are enlarged. And remember that some of them will produce cytokines. Not all of them, but enough to make a lot of trouble. <laughs> enough to fix some problems and also some times to uh, cause, some cause some problems of their own. All right, so let's talk about what cytokines actually are. What cytokines are, are uh, chemical messengers that cause things to happen. Typical examples of cytokines that we study in my class would be just like the interleukins, for example. There's a number of different types of interleukins. They all have their own little purpose, IL-1, IL-6, IL-12. Colony stimulating factors are oftentimes considered to be cytokines. Some people would consider um, interferons to be cytokines, although it's not, they're not exactly produced by the white blood cells, so I won't include them on this list. The one that we're actually most interested today is called tumor necrosis factor. And especially TNF alpha, tumor necrosis factor. Uh, and this is the one that seems to be causing the most trouble to, uh, to my, in my son's case and oftentimes with other cases as well. Tumor necrosis factor, what it's going to do is it's going to go and interact with cells. Uh, kind of as the name suggests, a tumor necrosis factor is technically meant to detect um, problems in a cell and start a process called apoptosis or cell death. Um, but in reality, what it does is it doesn't usually cause cell death. It just starts to cause trouble inside of the cell, and it might initiate pathways for cell death, and it might not. Uh, oftentimes, the body is, uh, the cell is trying to derive exactly what it's supposed to do in response to the TNF alpha. So the TNF alpha is uh, actually secreted by a number of different white blood cells, but the main one that sec that secretes it would be uh, the macrophage. It's activated macrophages. In terms of the immune response, there are three big players. Uh, and there's a whole other, there's many other cells as well, but the three, the three that we usually discuss would be macrophages, B lymphocytes, and T lymphocytes. I did mention B lymphocytes earlier in terms of there are some rare autoimmune conditions that can actually be caused by B lymphocytes, but oftentimes B lymphocytes are not really particularly part of the autoimmune pathway, but T lymphocytes are and macrophages are for sure. So macrophages would be the cells that would be the biggest culprits in terms of producing TNF and interacting then um, the, and causing some trouble with the surrounding tissues. It seems to be that TNF alpha that interacts, for example, with the cells of my son's eyes. 
with his iris, with his, uh, with his uh, ciliary body, I think in particular, uh, to cause some trouble. And those cells then respond by expanding themselves and um, starting to communicate more amongst themselves and having cellular processes that are not necessarily normal. But I'm, I'm actually not completely familiar with how the TNF pathway works. Um, as I said, I've never taken or taught this class, so um, I'm not, I've, been, I've been trying to figure it out, but it's not completely clear. I've kind of alluded to this, but I wanted to kind of give a, a, a visual on this. When we talk about cytokines, we are talking about macrophages and T lymphocytes. There are a few other white blood cells that also will uh, release cytokines, but these are the big players. And the macrophages in particular seem to be the culprits that are most harmful when it comes to the inflammatory pathway that we're discussing with my son's condition, with, uh, with his uveitis. Macrophages, to be clear, release tumor necrosis factor, or TNF-alpha. And in a general sense, what I also want to say about cytokines is that there's, it's sort of an upward cycle. You know, once cytokines are released, they cause the release of other cytokines. For example, macrophages, when they release cytokines, they will actually enhance the production of T lymphocytes that in turn cause the release of cytokines, and then that causes the release of more macrophages, <laughs> which causes the release of more uh, cytokines. So it's this upward spiral, what we would call um, a positive feedback homeostatic loop. Um, where you're constantly going up and up and up. And this could lead, for example, to the cytokine storm that I suggested earlier. In an autoimmune disorder, it's basically the same thing. <laughs> it just keeps on going and oftentimes becomes exacerbated. The presence of some cytokines leads to the presence of more white blood cells, which leads to the presence of more cytokines, which leads to the presence of more white blood cells. Um, and it's, it's a constantly up, up cycling situation. The question that I've been trying to answer that I think a lot of people with autoimmune conditions is, why did it happen? <laughs> like, I want to know on a cellular, molecular level, why? Why is it that TNF-alpha is secreted interacting with cells in, you know, in my son's eyes and the synovial membranes of his knees? I've never seen an answer to these questions. Maybe I'm watching the wrong seminars, but I have looked far and wide to try to figure out the actual answer to that question. Why is his body attacking itself? <laughs> this is the mystery that uh, I think researchers in this field are always trying to answer. I haven't seen any answer yet. I haven't seen it. Why do these cells <laughs> attract these macrophages? that secrete this TNF-alpha that cause all of these issues. Why? Why? I don't think that we have the answer. I could be wrong. This is not a field, again, that I'm familiar with, but I, I don't think that we know why. All we can do is say, okay, this tissue is inflamed. This tissue is exhibiting an autoimmune response. Let's see what we can do to mitigate the inflammation. Let's see what we can do to diminish this episode. Let's see if we can't put this patient into remission. And so we're focusing on the symptoms. And as far as I can tell, we're unable to ever really process at a molecular level, at a cellular level, exactly what's happening and how to fix it. Well, fortunately, we're getting a lot better at treating these things. So let's move into the treatment protocol. If your pain is really extraordinary, you might actually want to shut down the nervous response to the pain and therefore there's a class of drugs it's actually like kind of a really general class of drugs called opioids um, opioids that are most well known would be things like um, morphine heroin <laughs> some things that are legal and some things that are not legal fentanyl uh, codeine uh, per percocet these would be things that interact directly with the nervous system and actually just deaden the body's response to the pain at all so that it's interacting either at the level of the brain or at the peripheral nervous system to simply interfere with the pain response itself and it desensitizes you to pain. To be clear, opioids are completely outside of the inflammatory pathway and there is, I don't think there's any benefit at all 
to taking an opioid in terms of inflammation. I don't think there's anything that the opioids will do to actually interact or interfere with an, infl in, in, in actual inflammation. Instead, it's dealing with those first two aspects of pain, which would be the nervous system, the nerve endings or the nerves themselves. So let's discuss NSAIDs. NSAIDs. NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, so what these are, it says non-steroidal, which as you notice, the very next thing on the list is the steroids. So a non-steroidal drug would be something that doesn't cause all of the secondary effects that steroids tend to have. So an NSAID is oftentimes the first line of treatment for uh, an autoimmune disorder. Uh, the NSAID that we dealt with with Grayson's knees was naproxen, which was very effective, a high dose of naproxen. Other NSAIDs you might know about would be ibuprofen, um, Advil, Tordal. Now what NSAIDs do, as you notice, number one here, NSAIDs, NSAIDs are COX inhibitors, cyclooxygenase. <laughs> Sorry. So cyclooxygenase is a, an enzyme that is produced by, I, I think, most cells of your body, and it allows for the release of a structure called the prostaglandin. So prostaglandins do a number of different things. They're basically autocrines or paracrines. They're locally released hormones that cause a number of different effects. So a COX inhibitor, such, an, such as an NSAID, will probably have far-reaching effects. But one of the things that we know that it does for sure is it mitigates the release of prostaglandins, and one of the things that prostaglandins do is they cause this vasodilation of the arterial. So the, the reason why NSAIDs are so effective is that they actually go all the way upstream to this dilated, uh, to this dilated arterial and they constrict it. They cause it to go back to something resembling a more normal arterial so that, I mean, this is genius, like there's just less fluid coming into the region and therefore the whole source of inflammation in the first place is mitigated. So prostaglandins cause a dilated arterial. If we can cause fewer prostaglandins to be present in the area, the arterioles will be constricted back to a more reasonable size, and you'll simply have fewer fluids coming into the region. A, a reasonable and actually very effective way to mitigate the inflammation in the first place. So NSAIDs are oftentimes used to mitigate inflammatory events, to mitigate pain, because inflammation causes pain, um, and they're quite effective. The next class of drugs we're going to be looking at are the steroids. Here they are. I've decided to draw our number two right here. Steroids are a class of drugs that are fatty, so they can go through those phospholipid membranes on the outer membrane of a cell, puncture right through, and interact directly with the DNA. Very, very effective, these steroids. Um, but the disadvantage is that they will act on pretty much all of the cells in an area or many of the cells in an area. So what they do is they interact with the DNA. They oftentimes will lessen the production of a particular gene, like a gene transcribing into and, and then translating into a protein. Um, they will interact directly with that DNA. They will lessen the production of a particular protein. Sometimes they will enhance the produ production of a particular protein, but I think oftentimes they're thought to diminish cellular activity. Uh, so that's one of the effective things that steroids can do. Sometimes the steroids will work directly on the cells in the area, uh, on all of the cells in the area, unfortunately, including the ones that are supposed to keep on working. <laughs> and if you diminish their activity, you might have secondary effects. That's why steroids oftentimes are used only for a short period of time and that they try to keep them as local as possible. One of the things that steroids are particularly effective in this in general infl inflammatory pathway is to lessen the release of white blood cells. It turns out that white blood cells, they need to line up kind of along the wall of the blood vessel in order to be released from that intracellular cleft. So the white blood cells need to be lining up along the inside wall and then they're released more readily from the intercellular cleft. Uh, one of the things that steroids do that is very effective in the inflammatory pathway is they lessen the ability of those white blood cells to line up along the wall. 
So fewer white blood cells will be leaving through those intercellular clefts. The steroids that Grayson was on for his knee, he had a steroid injection into his knee. He had cortisol, cortisone injected directly into his knee. The steroids were actually the first line of treatment for his eyes. He was never given NSAIDs for the, the inflammatory events in his eyes. They actually started off with steroid eye drops, uh, Durazol and prednisolone. Um, uh, these eye drops were simply eye drops dr dropped directly into the anterior part of his eye because all of his infl inflammation in his eye is kept to the front. It's kept, it's called anterior uveitis. However, just so you know, sometimes um, folks will have panuveitis or uh, posterior uveitis, which means that the inflammation is toward the back of their eyes. Eye drops at the front of the eyes will not do. So what sounds like a, a really unpleasant medical procedure must be performed. And they actually take, I think it's down here, they inject <laughs> the steroid directly into the posterior of the eyeball. They basically put it inside, but toward the back. I just can't even think about it. Oof. Steroids are oftentimes very effective. Uh, you have to be careful. I've talked about this in another video. You have to be careful about how long the patient remains on steroids. You have to always monitor other secondary symptoms to make sure, for example, if you're putting steroid eye drops in the eye, you might have a buildup of pressure because you're shutting down certain cellular processes um, that help to drain the fluids out of the eyes. And so you might have a buildup of the fluid pressure inside of the eyes as a secondary response to the steroids. So you, you're always monitoring for these other issues. So if the, if the NSAIDs and the steroids don't do it, we move on to structures called antimetabolites. Now three and four here, three and four here, antimetabolites and biologics are both what we call immunomodulatory drugs. Now what they do, this is what we call a systemic situation. When you looked at steroids, again, steroids are almost always considered local treatments, you know, injected right into the area or dropped right into the area of, of inflammation. But when you're looking at anti-metabolites and biologics, now we're treating the patient systemically. We're giving them something, we're injecting it directly into the bloodstream so that the entire body is actually affected. This is, this would, both of these would be classes of drugs called immunomodulatory drugs so that the entire immune system is diminished in its activity. The whole thing, not just locally, but the whole thing. So these are oftentimes called immunosuppressants. It suppresses the activity of the immune system in general. The antimetabolite that Grayson was given was methotrexate. This seems to be almost uh, the universal treatment. Off the top of my head, I'm actually not sure of any other antimetabolites. Methotrexate, I think it was started to be produced in the 1940s. It started being used in the 1950s as a cancer drug. What an antimetabolite does is it basically diminishes the production of fast-produced uh, fast cells in your body. So the reason why methotrexate might be used for uh, cancer is that if you have a cancerous tumor that is growing quickly, an antimetabolite, such as methotrexate, will diminish the ability of those cells to keep on replicating. And the same is true actually for the immune system. These are cells that are produced in the red bone marrow, and you're constantly producing these cells. And so antimetabolites in this case, such as methotrexate, will diminish the ability of the red bone marrow to keep on producing all of these white blood cells. And you end up with a uh, low white blood cell count. Grayson, who is currently on methotrexate, the whole time he's on methotrexate, we have to be careful of certain things. For example, we have to get a white blood cell count on a regular basis and make sure that he's still within reasonable levels. Just prior to the pandemic coming around, we, um, we did a white blood cell count and we found the B cells and the T cells were actually pretty low, which uh, the doctors told me not to worry, but I was worried because these are, these are the powerful players when you're trying to fight off something that is particularly uh, damaging, such as a virus that is uh, that's going to cause a lot of havoc in your body, you really want to have those cells as active as possible. So anyway, that's what antimetabolites do in general. They just reduce the, the presence of white blood cells. They reduce the number. I thought I would take a moment to show you what the methotrexate looks like. So we have a syringe. This syringe actually has 
a small needle. Grayson's actually getting an injection tonight. Sorry, buddy. Um, it looks pretty big actually in the camera here, but this is actually a really small needle. This is the methotrexate. Methotrexate is actually quite easy to procure. You can get methotrexate at your local pharmacy. It doesn't cost that much money. I think it only costs us like, I think maybe five or seven dollars a vial, and it usually lasts for about, um, for maybe five doses. All right, so I'm gonna take my little syringe. I plunge it back, push it in, and then pull it out. The nurse had told me that when you, let's see if I can see it coming out here, that if you kind of start start with it, the plunger plunged back and then push it in, it makes it a little bit easier to draw it back. All right, so this the methotrexate, we give him 60 ml. There we go. And this is the actual, this, this um, medication, Grayson finds to be um, pretty difficult to take. And now I found out that it's pretty common for children especially to feel, uh, to feel sort of, well, when he first started getting injected with this stuff, it was the large amount of it and the fact that it's yellow, it just kind of made him, it grossed him out. Um, so, um, at this point, there's pretty much no exception to it. Whenever we inject the methotrexate, he immediately regurgitates everything that's in his stomach. There's, it happens every time. Um, but I found out that that's actually normal and for sometimes for the patient to begin regurgitation prior to the injection even happening, sort of as an anticipation of the, how they're going to feel. <laughs> Steroid eye drops and methotrexate. In Grayson's case, it didn't help that much. Um, he did sometimes have symptoms that went down, but oftentimes they'd spring right back up again. These episodes would be continuing. So this is when we turn to the biologic. Um, at, it's called Humira, and the actual name, the actual drug name is adalimumab. Adalimumab. The biologics are a whole class of drugs that are basically producing structures that are naturally created within the body. For example, antibodies, in this case, antibodies, or different chemicals that might be produced in the body. I noticed I wasn't being particularly efficient with my words or explaining things well, and I think it was because I was sort of getting worn out by the end of uh, what was uh, actually a several hour long process. So I'm gonna help out at this point <laughs> and see if I can give a little bit more clarity. Humira is a pure solution that is just chock full of antibodies. Now antibodies are free floating proteins that float through your blood plasma, your interstitial fluid, and your lymphatic system. And what these antibodies are, it's a, it's a protein, so it's a kind of a complicated molecule, and it's a Y shape. Generally speaking, antibodies are gonna be Y shaped. So they have a stem, and then they have two little arms that uh, specifically bind to something. We oftentimes think of antibodies as binding to something like a virus or a pathogen of some kind. But in fact, uh, antibodies can sort of be programmed in some ways to bind to any number of things, toxins, snake venom, or um, in this case, uh, a particular cytokine. Antibodies, because of these two little binding sites, uh, the Y shape here is important. These two binding sites are extremely specific to the one thing that they're able to bind to. And so these two binding sites means that they can actually bind to two things at the same time. And there's a number of things that antibodies will do from that point. Uh, they might, for example, bind them all up and clump a bunch of these structures together, rendering them useless and then simply allowing the body to dispose of them. Um, and that would be maybe one of the more powerful ways that antibodies work. Um, they work through numbers. Since they're simple molecules, they're, well, they're not simple molecules, but they, they are molecules. They don't have like a brain. <laughs> There's no directionality or choice here. It's simply numbers. Uh, antibodies tend to be released in the billions. You ha tend to have 
you know, your entire body is just suffused with these things. And it's the sheer numbers of them that make them extremely useful for getting rid of things that you don't want in your body. So Humira adalimumab, adalimumab <laughs> is a medicine that is basically a solution of antibodies that specifically bind to tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF alpha. We cannot manufacture, I don't think anyway, I, I don't think we can simply manufacture antibodies from scratch. They are more complicated than that. We do have to manipulate the process so that cells will then manufacture the antibodies. The, the types of cells that secrete antibodies are called B lymphocytes. I mentioned them earlier. B lymphocytes or B cells are able to clone themselves and into these other cells called plasma cells. And the plasma cells then put out boatloads of antibodies for over the course of several days. All of these antibodies will be perfect clones of each other with those two binding sites for each one. Again, seeking out that one particular thing that they're looking for. Antibodies are created within your own self naturally by your own B lymphocytes. And this is what we call an endogenous creation of antibodies, an endogenous replication of antibodies, endogenous cloning. Endo meaning a root that means within. There's also exogenous programming, which would be outside of the body. So endogenous is when your body naturally manufactures the, the B lymphocytes and therefore the antibodies that then go after something, for example, that you've been infected with. Exogenous would be where you take antibody, where you take B lymphocytes from maybe an animal donor, and then you manipulate that the B lymphocytes outside of your own body to create tons of antibodies. You take them and then you place them back into your body. Now, exogenous application of an antibody would include things such as a baby um, suckling for breast milk, and there's antibodies that are part of that. So if there's so the mother will be able to donate antibodies to a suckling baby. Or antibodies can actually be transferred to a certain extent during a pregnancy from mother to fetus, for example. So this would be called uh, a donation of an antibody. But a, a, a more, more common way that we donate antibodies is by using an animal model and manipulating that animal to manufacture tons and tons of antibodies. When we discuss Humira, it's quite special. It's what we call a monoclonal antibody. Monoclonal, monoclonal meaning only one clone as opposed to polyclonal. Now I've worked with antibodies in the past as part of my graduate studies, as part of my research, and I've always worked with polyclonal antibodies because they are relatively, um, they're readily available on the free market basically. <laughs> so the way that polyclonal antibodies work is that you manipulate an actual animal uh, to manufacture tons and tons of antibodies that you are interested in. So oftentimes this will be an animal such as a rabbit or a rat or a goat. In the olden days when they first started this kind of a thing, it was horses, I believe, because they're such large animals. Um, so what you do is you, you manipulate the animal to create tons and tons of antibodies and then you spin down their blood. The blood plasma floats to the top all those wonderful antibodies will be inside of that blood plasma. And then the animal will have manufactured the antibody that you're interested in, but also will have manufactured other antibodies against things that maybe they're naturally fighting off or your body uh, to a certain extent manufactures antibodies uh, throughout your lifetime, uh, whether you're there's just some antibodies that are always being manufactured um, pretty much from the time that you're born, about a month after you're born. Uh, and so you're always going to have multiple antibodies in there. So polyclonal antibody solutions would mean that there's antibodies that you're interested in, but also other antibodies that the animal has manufactured itself. Now, monoclonal antibodies are manufactured in a different way. And because of this, it takes a lot longer to procure the antibodies, and it's really, really expensive, actually. So monoclonal antibodies are manufactured by taking B lymphocytes out of whatever animal donor, putting them into a dish. So the process I described a moment ago is what we call an in vivo situation. The living animal manufactures the thing. 
but you can actually take B lymphocytes and put them basically into a Petri dish, what we call an in vitro matrix, and then manipulate those B lymphocytes to only manufacture the one antibody that you're actually interested in. It takes a lot longer, it's very expensive, but it's also very special. You get a huge concentration of just the antibody that you want. Now, my understanding is that adalimumab also, Humira, is also a human-derived antibody, which means that it's not just taking B lymphocytes from any old animal. My understanding is they actually have taken a line of B lymphocytes from, from humans, actually, um, which probably makes it much more difficult, um, many more permissions required and so on, um, which has probably slowed down the process even more and makes them all the more special. There's the ability to basically bioengineer antibodies using an animal model, but I'm guessing that when you use a human, a human model with all of the genetic similarity between humans, I think that that probably would make it that much more effective. And it turns out that Humira is extremely effective and it turns out with not many side effects at all. Here it is. We take the Humira and we uh, there's the solution in there if you can kind of see it just at the very tip here in the syringe and there is going to be millions upon millions of antibodies in there um, and twice a month we inject this into Grayson's bloodstream and then he, you know, the antibodies that are donated do not last that long. They only last about, I would say, maybe like three weeks. And then they are eventually broken down and absorbed and disposed of by the body. So this is the, this is the syringe that we get. We get two of these. Comes in a, you know, it comes in a little package. <laughs> two of them inside of a much larger box, of course. Um, and... That's Humira. This costs $1,300. Two of these syringes cost $2,600. We don't actually pay that much money. We get discounts. Of course, our insurance covers part of this, and we also get a steep discount from the manufacturer itself. This is not the kind of medicine that you can just go to Walgreens and pick it up. Uh, you actually have to, there was a pretty intensive process in going through the, especially the first time that we had nurses calling us for six months to make sure that there were no issues. Um, I'm not sure exactly why that was. Humira has been on the market for about nine years, I think, um, maybe since 2010, so maybe 11 years. It's only been okayed by the FDA for the use of, of what Grayson's condition of uveitis for about, um, since about 2016. So perhaps it's because it's in its preliminary phases and maybe it's not used that much in children. Uh, they're still unsure of exactly, you know, exactly whether there would be side effects and so on. So, so yes, Humira is a special medication, monoclonal antibodies, human derived, um, and, uh, and it turns out extremely effective. It really goes after and targets just that TNF that seems to be the cytokine that's causing us all those, all those problems. Prior to Humira coming onto the market in, you know, whatever year that it started to be okayed for use for various autoimmune conditions, prior to that, the, uh, the, uh, all, there was another, and I believe it was a TNF blocker, that also was very effective called infliximab. So sometimes physicians will use one and then try the other. Um, if, the one, if the first one isn't working as well, they'll try the other one. There are other TNF blockers as well. You know, Humira is extremely specific. But there are other, there are actually other drugs and other foods that work as TNF blockers. I came across a paper that discussed a derivative of turmeric, the spice, that is actually serves as a TNF blocker. I, I like those kind of papers because it <laughs> it kind of unites the two sides of what I'm trying to rectify in my own mind, which is the natural homeopathic type medications with the more scientific side of me that wants to know how things actually work. Ayurvedic medicine has been around since uh, thousands of years. Ayurvedic medicine 
which utilizes various means such as, uh, there's, there's a number of different components to Ayurvedic medicine, but one of the big things is healing through spices, for example. Will say, you know, I think that turmeric is good for me. I think it helps my immune system. And now we have an idea of exactly why that is. It's literally a TNF blocker. <laughs> I really like that tie-in between holistic medicine and what we would consider more Western medicine styles or a Western scientific culture. People who um, innately believe or innately understand a particular uh, component of their healing process, they innately understand it to work a particular way because they've seen it in their own practices. Um, their Ayurvedic practices, yeah, that yes, yes, what you believe to be true is in fact true. And now we kind of have a better idea of why that's more based in science. As I was going through the lectures that I was listening to on YouTube, I must say that one of the things that struck me is how, it, although we are getting much better at diagnosing autoimmune conditions and we're getting much better at treating them, there still is a certain amount of Quite honestly, it seems like experimentation, you know, <laughs> like where the, the physicians don't necessarily know exactly how a patient will react and they'll just try different drug protocols. Uh, <laughs> and maybe part of that is because autoimmune conditions can be so variable between people, I guess. Just to summarize Grayson's treatment protocols, well, the knees were the first problem we dealt with. He was treated with NSAIDs and he was treated with steroids. Uh, then when we know, knew that there was a problem with his eyes, we started with steroids and then we moved on to our methotrexate and then we moved on to our Humira, our um, immunomodulatory medications here, our methotrexate, which is an anti-metabolite and our Humira, which is a biologic um, and in fact an antibody. Um, a very specific, very cool, very expensive, and hard to produce antibody. So that's where we're at now. This one twice a month, this time three times a month, and they both seem to work in, con in concert with each other. Um, it is also thought that methotrexate might help in case the body starts to reject the antibodies that are being exogenously applied, that are being injected into the bloodstream. The body might actually uh, uh, start to build up uh, immunity against those antibodies. And it is thought that the methotrexate helps to quell that particular immuno, um, that, that particular immune, um, immune reaction. Um, but it is thought also that they simply work in concert with each other. This one, methotrexate, to help reduce the number of white blood cells that are pouring into <laughs> the eye uh, or into the tissue of interest. And then this one, the Humira, uh, to help to, um, d the, the white blood cells that are there when they're outpouring all of that, that um, TNF to help to reduce the reaction against that. Honestly, I'm still kind of sorting out a lot of the stories for myself. Um, so I'm gonna be watching this back and seeing if it's even usable and if I should post it, <laughs> we'll see. In case I do actually use this footage, uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for sitting through all of this. I learned a lot about inflammation and about autoimmune disorders through this process. Someday maybe he'll watch this back and he'll understand it a little bit better too. Bye.